<laughs> okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, yesterday, I, uh, who is here, uh, felt it necessary to introduce herself and there was absolutely no necessity to do so because she's well known. I'm a dinosaur, so I think that I should just say who I am, that my name is Stephen Ashheim and that I used to teach at this august institution. But every time I come here, which is once every few months, they kind of look at me and say, are you still alive? <laughs> so, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce this lecture, and like Aya did yesterday, before I introduced Celia Applegate, say a few words about uh, the Mossa connection. I'm not going to uh, go over the whole history. I think uh, yesterday Aya did much of that. Um, but I will say that um, institutions have a way of deteriorating, of slowly declining. Uh, in this case, it's just become more and more vital, and more and more experimental, with more and more participants. I must say, I was there at the beginning. Maybe that's why I arrived at the beginning. It was rotting. But since Sky has taken over, the program has absolutely blossomed. And it's his enthusiasm, his invigorating, infectious way of dealing with things, I think that we should all be extremely appreciative of. I've also just met Tylee, uh, who seems to be doing a wonderful job. So uh, maybe it's glad that the dinosauric age is over. Let me just say one word about the Mossa lectures because um, Celia Applegate, I think, is joining uh, a very august list of people who have given the Mossa lectures, and I'll very briefly uh, mention uh, some of them. It was opened by Christopher Browning, then we had Jan Asman, Ruth Harris, Michael Maris, Mary Gluck, Marty J, Sarah Stein, Dagmar Herzog, Tara Zara, and then we get to uh, Celia Applegate. So, um, I will say one or two words uh, about uh, Celia Applegate, although I don't think she needs another introduction. Um, let me put it this way. Uh, you are probably not aware that there is a Mossa connection. Because yesterday you spoke about all the emigres, but you had never met George. Mm -hmm. The common denominator is that both of you studied at Haverford College. Oh, and uh, George was at Haverford College, probably at a different, different time. time. For me. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, Celia Applegate, uh, who I think, if you weren't here yes before, is teaching at Vanderbilt University. Um, I'm not going to go through all her achievements, but amongst her, her books uh, is A Nation of Provincials, the German idea of, of Heimat, and other things. But I want to, to explore, just for a provocative moment, uh, the Mossa Applegate <laughs> difference. Uh, what would the difference, the difference be? First of all, in the index of the Nation of Provincials, Masa is not there. He's absent. So um, we have to put him in somewhere. And given, given this absence, I had a look at um, basically what does George say about Heimat? And what do you say about Heimat? In George's book on the crisis of German ideology, there's only one mention of Heimat. The whole book is about folkish ideology. One mention. And it has to do with the creation of what were called Heimat schools. And there he does declare that the Heimat schools, which were folkish institutions according to him, did bring up questions of race and German power. Whereas your very interesting take is a highly different take to the Mossian take, in which, if I can just quote for it, this is an alternative, the love of Heimat constituted an alternative vision of German unity to the familiar, aggressive, and militaristic one. 
So the good thing is that even great historians undergo revision and challenge. And it is to your credit that there is sort of this unspoken, yeah, yeah. if you like, dialogue. So we are about to hear the second lecture in the series of music given by Celia Applegate. Please. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm very stimulated by it. And I, thinking back, I was thinking that I was doing something against him, uh, looking at the local, the local level of things and not just the nation. So <laughs> it's good. OK, this one is um, music as work. Uh, it's mostly about professional musicians, but I begin with amateur musicians. And um, I, what the really beginning is, um, is an American. In 1878, James Monroe Trotter wrote a book called Music and Some Highly Musical People. Trotter was a black American born into slavery in Mississippi who became a teacher, a Civil War soldier in the Union Army, a post office employee, and eventually the first black recorder of deeds in Washington, D.C., and don't ask me what a recorder of deeds does. His book consisted of biographies of black American musicians and touring groups such as the Jubilee Singers of Fisk University, and it included great dollops of praise for German musicians, both professional and amateur. The German race, he wrote, is remarkable for the intelligence, steadiness, and industry of its members and their love for and cultivation of the art of music. It is rare to find a German who is not, in some sense, a musician. How in keeping is a musical love so warm and a mus musical proficiency so general with a nation which has given to the world a Mozart, a Haydn, and Beethoven? Trotter's likeliest informant for his knowledge of European musicians was his teacher's teacher, that was Lowell Mason. Mason was a leader in musical pedagogy. Uh, he preached the gospel of higher musical culture uh, of Europe to improve American musical life. Mason traveled to the Central Europe twice, which confirmed his belief that Germans made the best music. Uh, after an orchestra performance in Leipzig in 1852, he wrote that we Americans must indeed be dependent upon foreign artists for generations to come. Especially, um, we should be dependent on the Germans. Meanwhile, Americans could aspire to be like German audiences. Uh, he noted that new compositions were listened to with attention by a discriminating audience and met a favorable reception, and good music is demanded by large and intelligent audiences. Mason compared the Gewandhaus concert series to a high school, and again his quote, a quote, where taste is formed in the young and perfected in the old, and where the appreciation and love of musical art are made manifest. Most of this lecture, as I've said, is, is to be about professional musicians, the people who earn their living through their musical talents and training. But before that, I want to say something about those Germans, the amateurs, who, as Trotter wrote, were also, in some sense at least, musicians. Not long after Lowell uh, uh, Mason's visit to Leipzig, the English social critic uh, Henry Mayhew went to Germany to search for traces of Martin Luther's life and found the country to be less clean and civilized than England, um, but ringing with music, often annoyingly so. In a small village outside of Eisenach, he and his wife found accommodation uh, in, a, in, a, in a small village, um, and he, they were um, taken into a repurposed schoolhouse, which was filled with beds and musical instruments. Uh, they heard the daily practice of the parish band and dancing and singing after dinner at the cantor's house. The numbers of choral societies in this small town astonished him. Um, and their musicality impressed him, 
I'm quoting him now. Almost every native is able to read music at sight. Their skills, early educated and exercised throughout life, were among the most distinctive characters of the people. So together, these testimonies point to a variety of musical practices that engaged people who were not and never wanted to be musicians by profession. This phenomenon had deep historical roots in Stadtmusik, city music, in which townspeople participated, in court music, in which aristocratic amateurs played along with the hired help, and church music, which was central to the practice and spread of Protestantism, but also it was an integral part of German Catholicism. By the 19th century, what had once been an aspect of religious practices in the household became a multifaceted, less exclusively religious enjoyment of music at home, house musique. House musique has a quasi-technical and cultural meaning for Germans, and it is one of those words that might easily have jumped across the linguistic barrier and become practically English, like kindergarten, angst, and even Weltanschauung. It was sacred and secular, solo and small ensemble, and it included high art and popular music. It was suitable for every day and for festive occasions, for people with minimal to highly developed musical skills, for voices, a wide range of instruments, not just the piano. Amateur music making helped people to be active listeners. That's the better audiences than in the United States. Listening made them eager to try to play the music for themselves. Symphonies trans transcribed for four-handed performance. Oratorios composed for amateur choruses. A Viennese journalist wrote in 1845 that everyone knows that in Vienna there is no house without a piano. A Berlin reporter wrote that it was not a place uh, in which music is not practiced, and even in the cottages of country people it is not strange to find a flute, a violin, a pianoforte. Exclamation point from him. Of course, all this entailed work. So did joining a singing group, organizing a string quartet, and of course, practicing. Tedious and annoying to others, but indispensable. House music was defined by what it was not. I should have shown this earlier. Uh, Henry Mayhew, you got to love his face, okay? Uh, these are just pictures of house music and so on and so on. Um, it was not the music of the salon, the church, the opera house, and the concert hall. The word itself seems to have first appeared in the music press in the 1830s, principally in a series of articles in uh, Robert Schumann's uh, Neue Zeitschrift für Musik. Uh, the timing was not random. Beethoven, Beethoven had died in 1827. There was heightened consciousness of changing musical styles, and musical journals were buzzing with alarm about the new virtuosi. Um, deemed to be a menace to serious music, uh, showmen. A moral panic was underway, a fear that the flash and glamour of these charismatic figures threatened the various palettes of music cultivated in the home. That said, we perceive this phenomenon of amateurs mostly through professional eyes and ears. Music journalists talk about it, composers, publishers, music store owners, instrument makers, piano tuners, and teachers, among others. Through house music, professional musicians entered more homes than ever before, physically and virtually, extending beyond the aristocratic and wealthy people to people of modest means. Composers and teachers published scads of compositions and teaching guides intended for amateurs. And of course, the center of all this activity is the piano. It was becoming more affordable, and it opened up the door to music making in a way that no other instrument could. But how did so many Germans learn to read and play music? 
not from CPE box manual. 30 years after that school of schools, school, school of schools is Haydn's uh, t title for CPE Bach. An obscure musician, this is 30 years later than that, called Johann Peter Milchmeier, published an almost identically manual called The True Art of Playing the Piano Forte. You can see that. I, I, nobody on the internet has a picture of Milchmeier, as far as I can find. Um, he, he published this for amateurs and the be beginners of pianoforte playing. He intended it for provincial music teachers and their students in small and out of the way places, still far removed from the perfection of artistic cultivation. It included instruction on the position of the body, the arm, the hand, and the fingers, and a glossary of 136 Italian terms rendered into German. And like every teacher before or since, he urged the students to practice, practice, practice. The early morning seemed to Milchmeier an especially good time to do this. And uh, so I have a sort of long quotation. The rising sun brightens the mind, and study in the cheerful morning hours will develop every seed that nature has sown in us, driving it upward into a perfect productive tree. But in this crowded field of musical pedagogy, the laurels must go to Carl Czerny, working in the first half of the 19th century. From 110, I must have Czerny there, from his first thing, 110 Easy and Progressive Exercises, to The Art of the Finger Dexterity, to The School of Velocity, now you see you're getting, you know, very fast. His exercise treatises have sat on the pianos of countless households, starting with German ones in the 1830s, thereby condemning, condemning untold numbers of students to, as one musicologist said, solitary confinement at the piano. Nor did Czerny forget the ladies. His 1837 letters to a young lady on the art of playing the pianoforte highlight the nature of the household as the local stage on which gender relations were formed and literally performed. Czerny's advice to the young lady included a warning about the torments of failure in front of others and therefore to perform only in private circles. I'm going to have a glass of water. By the time Czerny was writing letters to young ladies, the professional opportunities for women had been reduced to opera singers and piano teachers with the occasional virtuoso such as Clara Wieck, later Schumann. This is different. In the last half of the 18th century, 50 or so German women had published music under their own names and performed in court ensembles. The number was never reached at any time in the 19th century. Later in the century, the new conservatories did not admit them, nor did symphony orchestras employ them. So in the 19th century, we must look for musical women where they mostly were at home, practicing the piano, teaching children, and sometimes adults to sing and play, accompanying others in their music. House music and its gendered practices, along with attending a concert or opera or singing an amateur chorus, remained the only acceptable means for a respectable woman to express her musicality. Learning to play the piano became as necessary as learning to sew. The, idea, the ideology of domesticity had swallowed up the female practice of music. Nevertheless, women persisted. My first one is a woman named Nina Dambony von Engelbrunner. Uh, and the second one I'll talk about is Johanna Kinkel. Neither of those were at all ambivalent about the musical accomplishments of women. And both were professional musicians disguising their work as music for the home. Daubigny, born in 1770, 
was a member of the lower ranks of nobility, educated, well-traveled, and had studied with a court musician in the tiny principality of Schaumburg Lippe. Regarded as an exceptionally talented amateur, she became a music teacher at the court and wrote a treatise in the form, and this is the femini feminization of it. it. She called it Letters to Natalie on Song as the Encouragement of Domestic Happiness Through Convivial Pleasures. But the content of them was a systematic stepwise training of a voice to sing even the most difficult repertoire. By the end of the book, her readers would have been better prepared to perform in public the works, and this is what she says, Haydn and Mozart in public, than to sing a lullaby at their children's cradle. Teaching private lessons, especially piano and voice lessons, was the fate of talented and professionally trained women musicians. Johanna Kinkel, a, a, and she's a 19th century person. She was born in 1810. She began teaching piano while still a student. She continued to do so through success in a solo career, performing, composing, and enjoying a halcyon period in the 1830s and 40s in the vibrant and serious music circle of Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel. She married the radical writer Gottfried Kinkel, fled with him after the 1848 revolution when he was captured and was going to be executed but escaped from the uh, Spandau prison. They ended up in London where they joined other German emigres. As Kinkel observed, we are now a whole colony of teachers in search of pupils. She endeavored to reproduce her professional world in ex exile, teaching piano and singing lessons for children. She spent time in the British Museum and wrote essays and gave lecture performances on German composers. And she wrote a guide for piano teachers titled, Eight Letters to a Friend on Piano Instruction. Between the lines are indications of the tedious, demanding, thankless nature of this work. She acknowledged the professional hazard of a teacher falling into semi-permanent sullenness, of losing patience, of becoming torpid, listless, and bored, and warned that those who have no patience and do not take joy in even the smallest success resulting from their efforts do not have the talent to be a teacher. In 1858, she died, falling uh, to her death from a window in her home. Uh, the death was recorded as an accident. Only in the later decades of the 19th century, when music conservatories began to spread across Central Europe, were women admitted to them, but they couldn't get a, they couldn't get a degree from them, but they could practice. <laughs> Uh, then, having trained for professional work, they were shut out of Germany's professional ensembles. Uh, the, th these are the three ones I talked about, and uh, you can see how grim a face uh, Johanna Kinkel has. What did the musical profession look like as it became a profession? The English economic historian Cyril Ehrlich, writing about the music profession in Britain, asked, how should we attempt to count and describe the profession, which embraced extremes of fame and obscurity, genius and mediocrity, mobility and quiescence? Ehrlich estimated there were about 2,000 musicians in Britain in 1800. I haven't counted them, but um, estimating it, we should probably quintuple that number in uh, German Europe. Given a population more than three times greater, a plethora of royal and noble households, churches and monasteries, uh, residential cities, commercial cities and towns, all with musical establishments. The question was whether one could make a decent living from it. Musicians with basic skills could find musical work, but their social status and compensation would be meager below that of a competent craftsman, as one sees in the lives of piano teachers. At the other end, uh, 
the extraordinarily talented musician might earn much more than a well-regarded physician, have more fame, and might even be described as a genius. Between these two extremes, there seemed limited space for a straightforward professional career that would be marked by income and social standing. Professional musicians were also vulnerable to the wayward course of politics. Their livelihood was often tied to the financial health of state institutions and the optimism of consumers. Even during long stretches of peace in Europe, the great majority of musicians did not hold the upper hand in negotiations with publishers and theater directors, nor was their social status clear or stable. In 1835, and already a celebrity, the 24-year-old Franz Liszt, this is not him, I'm coming to this person, um, he published a blistering tirade against this. He said, this materialistic society, these men and women whom we amuse and who buy our wares, yet who held artists in low estimation, oblivious to their sorrows and their privations, their fatigues and their deceptions, their ever bleeding wounds. So the puzzle of the 19th century, from the perspective of many musical workers, was that the more things changed, the more they stayed the same. As I said yesterday, the composer Johann Hassler, um, his father, had warned him that the music profession was a breadless art. At the end of the century, instrumentalists in Bernhard Polini's theater empire in Hamburg earned risible amounts of money and had to find other jobs during the off-season. Some were actually reduced to selling shoelaces on the streets. Yet in this same century, the musical work as a profession became visible as well as audible in new ways. Music journalism, this is the slide, um, expanded greatly in new ways, especially with the founding in 1798 of the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung by Friedrich Rochlis. He was a literary man, but, you know, because all Germans were musicians, he was also uh, had a sound musical education. He managed a stable of about 100 correspondents, reporting on more than 50 cities across Germany, in Europe, and occasionally in the world. It lasted until 1882, and by then there were many more dedicated musical journals and re regular musical reviews in Germany's city newspapers. And all of this, of course, is becoming visible. Musical work changed also because of what we would now call professionalization, specialization, and standardization, and along with that, commercialization and commodification. By the end of the century, Austro-German composers represented the highest standard in serious instrumental music and uh, a distinctive tradition of German uh, opera had emerged. German orchestras were admired, their conductors sought after. German conservatories drew students from all over the world. Some 2,000 North Americans had studied there by 1900. 2,000 Americans. Its music publishing houses were dominant, its musical scholars, instrument makers, and music critics authoritative. Nevertheless, uh, the process of achieving such professional uh, excellence, if we want to call it that, was never a straightforward matter. The social historian uh, Werner Kanza uh, defines Beruf, or profession, as a sphere of activities with associated duties and rights, which people undertake as continuing functions in the context of a social order which mostly serve to provide a living. Musicians fit into the definition only awkwardly, as I've always sort of said. The associated duties and rights which people undertake, these were highly disparate and often did not provide a living. The ecosystem of musical work was also changing. It required greater technical skills, and some musical instruments became more powerful and more difficult to play at the highest level, including the piano. New compositions demanded more of composers. 
And overall, the trend in the 19th century was for working lives of musicians to become more specialized and more exposed to the marketplace. Consider for a start, solo performers, um, men and women, the famous virtuosi. Uh, this is Paganini. In the 18th century, virtuoso referred to music theorists and composers, and later to the most accomplished members of a chord ensemble who would take on the solo parts. Then there were the precocious children, mainly male. Mozart is, of course, the model of this. Uh, the arc of a working life as a virtuoso or child prodigy began with concert tours and European-wide publicity and added to that some composing, all of which became essential to a solo performer's income. The quintessential virtuosi of the 19th century was a solo instrumentalist, usually a pianist or violinist. Uh, think Franz Liszt, who probably know what he looks like. Maybe I have a, yes, I do. I've forgotten that. that. Um, this, of course, is Niccolo Paganini, uh, who was considered almost a devil, as you can see in uh, the iconography of these things, the skull and so on. Um, he couldn't be that good unless the devil was helping him. Uh, and Franz Liszt, uh, in his uh, very spiritual, this is a picture of him at a young age, but he was also very spiritual, and so that's that painting. And you, that's Beethoven right there, the, the death mask of him. There were lots of Beethoven's death masks in people's houses. It's crazy. Okay, an early example was the pianist, uh, Johann Nepomuk Hummel, whose career unfolded in the wake of Mozart's and with his help. This career required talent, an ambitious parent with financial savvy, and lots of travel. Hummel's father was a director of military music in a provincial town of the Austrian Empire, who moved to Vienna when the musical talents of his very young child became obvious. He arranged for his son to play for Mozart, who took him into his household and taught him free of charge for two years. Later, when Hummel was still young, he took, uh, his father took him on a European tour that included London, just like Mozart. As an adult, Hummel settled down to composing, teaching, and performing as soloist, concertmaster, and kapellmeister. He joined the Freemasons. He took positions in a series of musical establishments, court ensembles in Central Europe, and ended his career in Weimar. There he became a close friend of Goethe and the Kapellmeister of the Ducal Court Orchestra. This then was what it meant to be at the top of the music profession in the first half of the 19th century. And it held the potential for fame, money, and later a good musical position. Um, and that's what Hummel uh, was. Hummel was aware of the insecurity even as a mu musician who had reached the highest rung of the ladder. In Weimar, he created a pension plan for his musicians, which he funded with benefit concert tours. Concerned about intellectual piracy, he was also a composer. He was an early proponent of musical copyright. About the same time that Hummel was directing the musical life of Weimar, 74 miles away in Leipzig, Friedrich Wieck attempted, in his words, to create a virtuosa. He kept his daughter Clara at the piano three hours every day from age seven on, one hour for a lesson, two for practice. Clara Wieck's first public performance was in Leipzig, her home, and then he took her on the road. By the end of her life, Clara Wieck Schumann had performed in more than 1,300 concerts. Beyond the publicity that virtuoso tours occasioned, these consummate performers helped the professional career of solo performers to evolve into something that sustained both body and soul. The hope was that touring would lead to a settled residence with time to compose and still tour. Professional chamber music quartets also toured, as did opera singers. 
The opera season meant that their regular jobs gave them ample time to make money in solo recitals with a piano accompanist. When their voice, voices wore out, they taught. Uh, this is kind of going down. <laughs> at, um, at, so now I'm going to uh, talk about the ensemble players, uh, which is not a very happy story. Soloists left a lot of evidence about their working lives. Ensemble players did not. Yet, there were, of course, many more of them in religious establishments as well as courts and cities and towns. I should probably have shown Clara. The notion that Stadtmusik, the collective term for civic ensembles, was disappearing was a continuous lament in the 19th century. But in fact, they survived all over Germany and continued to be both training ground and employer of many musicians. They contributed to the flourishing of musical festivals on big events of all kinds with the ready-to-hand supply of well-trained instrumentalists. As cities grew, so did the number of orchestras. Germany had more than in any other European country. The orchestras became bigger, and by the end of the century, a typical large city orchestra had gone up in size from about 20 musicians in the early 19th century to 90 at the end of it. Initially, the two orchestras of Paris, the opera orchestra and its offspring, the Société des Concerts, were so well trained that the early 19th century German musicians were astonished, hearing their own country's music played as they had never heard it. Felix Mendelssohn brought this training and discipline to Leipzig when he became the director of the Gewandhaus Orchestra. He had, he had gone to Paris many times. So musical competence in Germany um, did not emerge without effort. Early in the century, a set of instructions for a provincial orchestra specified that every player must adhere strictly to the musical notes on the score. No additions or ornaments were, are to be added where they do not exist. By the end of the century, a good ensemble player needed to be able to play several instruments with some modicum of competence, willing to perform any kind of repertoire willing to move around. If you wanted to find work, the more instruments you could play, the more likely you could find employment. That's Mendelssohn and the Gewandhaus. Now I'm going to talk about this man. This is Richard Mulfield, who was born in 1856, the son of a town music director. That's very common. He had early instruction in violin and piano. He taught himself to play the clarinet and had his first musical appointment as a second violinist in the Meiningen Court Orchestra. He spent his three-year military service as a clarinetist to play the clarinet. Um, and he then returned to Meiningen, and this time he only played the clarinet. Johannes Brahms heard the orchestra under the baton of Hans von Bülow. And hearing Mühlfeld was inspired to compose his surpassingly beautiful clarinet quintet for him in 1891. And I hope some of you have heard it. It's uh, one of our favorites. Its premiere represented Mühlfeld's breakthrough to fame. Uh, by the time he died, suddenly at age 51 of a heart attack, he had performed 645 concerts in 138 places. Music is hard work. And his was a success story. It began in the ranks, ranks of an ensemble and achieving his, by his 30s the commanding heights of the German musical life as a sought-after soloist. But as his career developed, it drew him further apart from the working life of an ensemble musician. Uh, the many shapes and sizes of music ensembles, small to large, court to state, municipal to private, symphony to opera, um, added up to a panorama of career possibilities, but also frustrations and disappointments. Some had salaries and welfare provisions, health, retirement, widow, and child benefits. Others had no salaries, no welfare provisions. Their work was poorly paid, insecure, irregular, in a word, exploitative. 
Musicians were often required to serve as probationers for 10 years at low pay, and then, in many cases, they were let go. Historian Martin Rempa, who has written about rank-and-file musicians, observed, and this is what, uh, his words, whether working for a court, a city, or a privately owned concern, orchestral musicians, as a rule, were not drawing closer in terms of income or social status to the bourgeois public they entertained. Their status stubbornly remained that of wage workers and artisans. That's the end of the quote. Only rarely did a musician get steady pay throughout the year. More common was to be paid in the winter season and be relegated to freelance status in the summer. Some were paid for rehearsing time, others were not. Outdoor venues were often cold, indoor ones overheated. During the off-season, musicians worked in casinos, restaurants, vaudeville ensembles, and spas, where they would typically have to pay not only for their instruments, but for formal, formal evening wear, which means that musicians were in fact expected to dress above their station and spend a lot of money on it. A widely used contract for theater musicians specified that they could be sacked for not memorizing their parts, undermining the authority of the director, and breaching, this is a quotation, one's duties to the state or to morality and decency, thereby bringing the artistic profession into disrepute. For the majority of workaday musicians, piecing together an income, job by job, hour by hour, they could expect no concessions to the overall welfare of the performing musician. Meanwhile, the road beckoned with the appeal of travel accompanied by some combination of hope and disappointment. These musicanten, or traveling musicians, had been a feature of the European musical landscape for centuries. And for almost that long, states had required them to, you know, to have a peddler's license. Peddler's license for people in formal uh, costumes. From the beginning to the end of the 19th century, musicians' diaries, reminiscences, and articles published in music journals describe the travails of constant travel, inadequate pay, and little joy in their work. Uh, given the less than perfect situation of music, musicians' lives, they also organized to improve it. As early as 1811, this man, a musician named Gottfried Weber, drafted a manual to help traveling musicians on the road. He called his proposed book A Musical Topography of Germany, and he subtitled it An Attempted Contribution to the History of Art and also a companion book for traveling musicians. This was useful knowledge. How to publicize yourself. What music would be popular. The local makers of instruments, and so on. In Basel, for instance, he noted, permission to give a concert must be obtained from the mayor. It is not likely to be refused. This proposed Baedeker for bandsmen suggests how arduous the life of the traveling musician could be. In the last decades of the 19th century, organizations of musicians became more possible and more necessary. This, this um, Weber thing was never published. Organizing became easier with better communications, and there was strong motivation in the face of what seemed to be worsening conditions of employment. The first effort was the German General Music Society, founded in 1861. It was Franz Liszt, possibly the most famous musician in Europe, uh, that started it. Uh, he had long advocated better pay and pensions for orchestral musicians. You know, he was very, very wealthy and famous, uh, but he was thinking for the people uh, who weren't. He joined up with Franz Brendel, the editor of the Neue Zeitschrift for Musik, uh, the journal that Schumann had founded. He, too, had been calling for a gathering of German musicians for collaborative pursuits of important goals, such as a collective will to oppose harmful influences. Brendel saw the project securing the foundations of artistic taste in the spirit of the nation. 
the society signed on about 200 musicians from 20 countries who pledged to safeguard and promote the craft and professional interests of musicians, improve their earnings, lobby for their interests in states and state um, assemblies. A second organization, I don't have a picture of them, sorry. A second organization followed in 1872, and this was called the German General Musicians Union, very close in this thing, but it was a, court, uh, it was a horse of a different color. No famous musicians, few members who were wealthy, no time spent worrying about taste and aesthetics. Its goal was to promote the economic and social interests of the rank and file, musicians rank and file. They had minor victories in protecting themselves from incursions from the musical equivalents of traveling salesmen. And they went to battle against incompetent music teachers and predatory for-profit music institutes, uh, which they had then, just like now, um, for-profit uh, universities, who churned out unqualified student musicians in debt up to their ears. These two organizations divided the musical world of Germany, representing the interests of German musicians, but by different means. Both dissolved by order of the National Socialist Government in 1933. I shall now turn to the conductors. And this is a picture of Hans von Bülow, who I've mentioned before. All these musicians needed to keep together in time which brings us to conductors. The Kapellmeisters of early modern court ensembles were often Italians. Uh, there was lots of resentment of this. Their main job was to compose, especially opera. Not much was expected of them regarding conducting, uh, and they were increasingly resented as unnecessary, indeed, distractions. As late as the 1840s, Robert Schumann complained about Felix Mendelssohn's use of a baton. So the baton, you know, is hard to get going. Uh, and Mendelssohn was, you know, he was, he was a first user, really. Uh, Schumann didn't like it. He said, the orchestra in a symphony should stand like a republic which requires no sovereign. Uh, but Schumann's objections were in vain. Uh, musical monarchy the visible symbol of which was the baton, had already triumphed. From 19-year-old Felix Mendelssohn, who used one in the revival of Bach's St. Matthew Passion in 1829, to Hector Berlioz, showing the Germans how a Frenchman worked it. And incidentally, he and Mendelssohn were friends, and they exchanged their batons, which is something that has become, I guess, a tradition among, uh, among conductors. Uh, to Wagner's many writings and demonstrations of how it should be wielded. The baton became the symbol of the rise and the rise of the charismatic conductor, the man who revealed the inner spirit of the music. And arguably, uh, but I think m many people would agree with this, the greatest conductor and certainly the most demanding of the 19th century was Hans von Bülow. He was 20 years old when Wagner summoned him to help him at the understaffed Zurich Opera, where Wagner was after being exiled. Um, and later he took on an amateur opera, to, opera orchestra in nearby St. Gallen. So that was his apprenticeship. A few years later, he had embarked on his remarkable career that took him to every major and many minor musical centers in Europe and in the United States. He was magnificent as a pianist, acerbic and controversial as a music critic and colleague, effective yet driven to exhaustion as a teacher, polished, demanding, confident, triumphant, and deeply admired as a conductor. Putting aside his remarkable work uh, as the con first conductor of the world premieres of Tristan and Isolde in 1865 and the Master Singers of Nuremberg in 1868. His qualities and practices that subsequently defined the modern professional conductor came through uh, in his leadership of, of, of a very small orchestra. It was the court orchestra of the Duchy of Saxe-Meiningen. That was from 1880 to 1885. 
By that time, he was an international celebrity, and he took the post essentially to show what he could do, bringing good and competent musicians to the pinnacle of greatness. And so now I'm going to tell you how he did it. Uh, he just wanted to show that you really did need a conductor. Boulot recruited new musicians, and he ident identified the most talented of those who were already in place. He assessed and organized the library of scores and bought more, which um, it, you assumed that they were all messed up and, <laughs> and they didn't even have many scores. Uh, he ordered the instruments to be repaired, and he ordered new instruments. And that was just the preliminaries. Rehearsals came next. And these he organized by what was thereafter known as the Meiningen Principle, and it was widely imitated. It involves breaking down the orchestra into its component parts, strings, wind, and brass, then further making the first violins alternate regularly with the second ones, as Bulow explained, so that the so-called elite suffer the indignity of occasionally playing second fiddle. Uh, it also involved having them memorize their parts and play by memory standing up, a practice he thought produced a fuller tone. People don't do this anymore. He downplayed symphonic fireworks and insisted on absolute fidelity to the score as the composer has, had intended it. Uh, a quotation from him, the music will be studied down to the slightest dynamic nuance. Every movement of the bow, every staccato note will be prescribed and regulated Phrasing and interpretation will be the subject of detailed study. There is no bagatelle in art. That is my maxim. So let me end this lecture by talking about yet another type of musical work which we don't often think about. It's not practicing or teaching or performing it, but organizing and promoting it. I'll get to and that. This is the man that I will talk about. Uh, this is the work of musical managers, impresarios. There had always been managers. In earlier times, they were aristocrats at the court or clergy. And of course, in special cases, the fathers of child prodigies, managing their child prodigies' careers. Solo artists, the virtuosi, who were prominent in the early decades of the 19th century, required help organizing their tours, which had become crucial to the financial stability of performing artists. Vienna, the most important musical city in Central Europe, had two committees to assemble concerts and invite touring musicians. Frankfurt, too, had a committee called, strangely, the Museum Society. Cities had music directors, a role Felix Mendelssohn filled in Leipzig. Hans von Bülow in Meiningen had occupied that role when he worked there, along with being the conductor. His formal title was Hof Musik Intendant, the General Director of Music. This meant that in addition to programming and conducting duties, work that he did superbly, his responsibilities included concert tours and managing publicity. These latter functions became more important over the course of the 19th century, and eventually scheduling concerts or organized tours became a profession of its own. The most famous concert agent in his time was Hermann Wolf, uh, this man, and, and I'll tell you what that ensemble is uh, pretty soon. Uh, he founded the Concert Direction Hermann Wolf in 1880, in 1882, when 54 musicians had broken away from an, an unsatisfactory quasi-entertainment orchestra in Berlin and decided to establish a serious one, led by the musicians themselves, Wolf shepherded them through the early years. Initially, he gave them advice, um, some money, and a name, the Berliner Philharmonic. Five years later, when they had decided to dissolve because they were again without funds, he stepped in as their manager, taking over administrative duties and infusing more capital into the enterprise. In a crowning gesture, he persuaded his good friend Hans von Bülow to become their conductor. 
Wolf was a key figure in more than just the survival and rise to greatness of the orchestra. He combined in one genial, highly musical, and well-connected businessman the many roles that are now divided up among you know, talent agents, booking agents, producers, impresarios. The decisive figure in Hermann Wolf's invention <coughs> of the modern concert tour management came in the form of Anton Rubinstein. I mean, he was, he was sort of the protege of Wolf. Um, he was, you know, the great Russian piano virtuoso, a prolific composer of works now rarely performed. He was introduced to European audiences when he was 14, and he spent the rest of his life alternating long tours in Europe and North America with professional and sometimes domestic uh, interludes in Russia, where he founded the St. Petersburg Conservatory and produced operas. He was also a man beset by financial frustrations. Rubinstein met Wolf in 1880 at a musical publishing house, Bata and Bock, where Wolf was employed. He was complaining about the travails of the road, and Hugo Bock pointed to his assistant, who speaks good English, perfect French, writes an excellent hand, possesses good judgment and in initiative, and loaned him out to Rubinstein for an upcoming tour through Spain. So that's the beginning of um, Rubinstein's financial <laughs> recovery and the beginning of Hermann Wolf's uh, career. So he became an impresario of the road. He took over management of the tours of Bulow's Meiningen Orchestra the same year, a massive undertaking, and in quick order began to arrange things for the Leipzig Gewandhaus and the orchestra of the Frankfurt Museum Society. When Bulow's orchestra came to Berlin in 1882, he financed the renovation of a multi-purpose building with a skating rink into a formal concert hall, one that subsequently became the home of the Berliner Philharmonic. After meeting Peter uh, Tchaikovsky in 1885, something of a protege of Bulow's, he took over his tours in Europe as well. And by 1891, Wolf represented 200 solo musicians, including pianists, violinists, singers, as well as a number of leading ensembles. His influence outside of Germany was strongest in the United States, uh, where he had particularly good relations with musical institutions in New York. As a quintessential middleman in a line of work known for sharp dealing and corner cutting, Wolf also had a reputation for honesty and generosity. In retrospect, these last decades of the 19th century constituted the high water mark for Germany's Jewish population, a time of extraordinary achievements in a multitude of fields and high levels of assimilation, although these existed alongside outbursts of a threatening new anti-Semitism. Many successful Jews deliberated um, and shunned the limelight to avoid attracting attention to themselves. Like Bismarck's banker, Gerson Bleichröder, or Bernhard Polini, another highly successful German-Jewish impresario in Hamburg, Wolf embodied the possibilities and limits of success. In his lifetime, as I've been telling you, he put Berlin on the musical map with his financing of the Philharmonic and his recruiting of conductors Bülow, and after Bülow's death, Arthur Nikisch. The most public of his acts in support of serious music was his building, financing, hiring architects, and so on, of the Bechstein Hall, a much-needed recital hall for Berlin. I think I have a picture of it. No, I guess I've never found one because it was burned down. Okay, a um, much-needed recital hall for Berlin. Even in that undertaking, he stayed behind the scenes. He persuaded the Beckstein Piano Manufactory to lend its name to it, while he provided the financing. For its opening celebrations in 1892, Wolf organized a series of spectacular recitals by Bülow, Brahms, Rubinstein, and Josef Joachim's String Quartet, a contentious group of superstars each of whom owed something of their fame to Wolf. But there were still many people who resented Jewish influence of any sort, uh, the more so when unobtrusive. August Ludwig, 
then the editor of a journal that Wolf had once led, wrote of the hall's opening that, quoting him, this concert agent was embarrassed to give the hall his own name, a name that is, as he well knows, despised, like Wolf's Hall or Wolf's Glen. So he commandeered that of the Beckstein Company, which incidentally denies any further connection with this concert hall enterprise. The latter charge was patently untrue. Carl Beckstein had a close and mutually profitable relationship with Wolf and the hall that bore his name. From its first season on, the Beckstein Hall was a great success. It served as a venue for hundreds of small concerts, uh, lectures every year, all organized by Concert Direction Hermann Wolf, and it made an important contribution to Berlin's rise as a musical metropolis. And I could go so far to say that it wouldn't have gained that reputation without him. By the 1920s, however, August Ludwig's unpleasant insinuations of the end of the 19th century bore fruit. Carl Beckstein's son, Edwin, a fervent National Socialist, sponsored Hitler's entree into high society and broke off all the Beckstein firm's ties to Wolf's agency. In 1933, warned by a sympathetic janitor, Wolf was dead by then. Wolf's daughters um, were able to remove to safekeeping the busts of Josef Joachim and Anton Rubinstein from pedestals next to Brahms and Bülow in the Beckstein Hall in advance of their planned destruction by members of the SA. The Beckstein Hall itself was destroyed by Allied bombing on November 22, 1944. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the floor is open for questions, criticisms, hmm? anything. No, no, no. No criticisms. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yes, please. Um, thank you very much. It was a very uh, rich picture of the uh, world of music in the 19th century. And um, I was wondering if you could maybe just in a nutshell. Um, make a comparison between this uh, world of uh, the work and other sorts of working class uh, professions so we could see how music is both similar and very different from other uh, developments mm -hmm. in, in the history of war. Yeah. And the other question is uh, if you could tell us more about this um, uh, expertise making um, People like one, like ones that uh, build their flute, uh, write something about it, also compose, and so composers, uh, instrument makers, all in the same person, and this um, development making composers uh, one sort of profession and um, players another, and instrument makers a totally different. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah, those are very, really good questions. The last one, I, I, I would um, have a very short uh, explanation. It, it's, it is like everything in um, industrialization. You know, everything becomes more specialized, and, um, and they have to be more specialized because there's more of it in some sense, that you have to be more expert in it. Um, and, uh, and it's also because of, you know, publicity, you know, all these people writing reviews, they weren't doing that much in the 18th century, so you could maybe, I, I don't want to say you could get away with things, but um, in any case, uh, the, the instruments were also more powerful and you had to have more, you know, you had to have more training in them and so on. Uh, so uh, that is one very big difference um, from the earlier times. And, you know, there, it's just, it, it really, does parallel um, the industrialization and, uh, and um, commercialization and all those Asian words that I said at one point. So uh, yeah, you could, uh, it, I, but I think publicity in, uh, is a lot of it. I mean, Kvantz, I, pe may, some people may, might have read his book, uh, probably a lot more because it was, you know, it remained in print. Um, but Hardly anyone would hear him play. Uh, it was just in the court. So it, it's the 
the stakes are higher. Um, and the, fir that's the wrong thing I should have done. You don't, if you forget the first question after you answer <laughs> the last one. Uh, so just remind me and then I'll get it quickly. Um, if you have a, maybe just a yeah. brief parallel in other uh, sort of uh, working uh, professions. Yes. Not yeah. Yeah, it's um, any it, of yeah. The development. yeah, yes. It, it's 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 a it's a um hard thing to say because they have people musicians can be in many uh social classes and the ones who are just working musicians uh, are you could call them artisans because you know they're just doing their job but they are probably uh more they were more open no they were more fragile in their jobs because they you know if you're artisan making something uh, you might not be making a lot of money but you would could do it everywhere you could have your your artisan work and do it there and maybe people would um, buy your things but the musicians had to it's it you know it goes back to the essence of music when you play it it disappears <laughs> And it's sort of like that for the musician before, before the phonograph, before recording. Um, they play it, um, and then it's over, and nobody's going to give you m more money for it. Uh, so it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very ephemeral uh, way to work. So that makes them, at the lowest level of them, um, I, I would say it, it would be a good comparison for people to make. I would say they were... Uh, much more exposed to the market even than uh, other workers. Um, but the ones who ha ha could compose, um, who could uh, command a, a tour, who could, conductors were pretty well paid, though, you know, some of them were also uh, probably moving around a lot. And there were also kind of places where you could go if you were desperate, like um, join the military and be a military musician, though. Many people like to be being military musicians. Are you? But the um, and if you couldn't do anything else, you could teach, which is what they say about all of us. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, please. I, I have a three different questions. The mm -hmm. first is about music and piano teaching, and you mentioned Carl Czerny, but what's about what's a Clementi who was a was wrote the first book. Yes. Uh, for which Czerny was. So you didn't mention that because he wasn't in Germany. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, and yeah, I, I, he 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 did come first. Um, and I I suspect that um, Czerny was just ba basically. It's it's all you know. It's all doing scales basically. And I. I I have not studied that enough to know what the difference would be between Clementi and Czerny. All I know is that my mother made me do Czerny and not Clementi. <laughs> I have two uh, other questions. Once you talk about conductors in America, mm -hmm. Miller was a model, but Hans Richter was as important in that time, and maybe more important because yeah. he did more Wagner premiere than Robrampton. Yes. Hans von Miller. So where, where he would stand in your story? And the third question is simply information. Mm -hmm. Tchaikovsky opened the Carnegie Hall in 19, May 1981. Was it worth uh, work so he would be an opening at Carnegie Hall? I, I, I don't know, but um, it sounds, it sounds plausible, you know, because I, I both had lots of, of contacts in the United States. Yeah, and um, Richter, I. I um, don't have him in this. Uh, he, there, there are many star conductors by the, um, the end of the 19th century. Because all of these things, again, publicity and so on, um, these, the, you know, people didn't really praise conductors as much as they did in the, uh, in the late 19th century as they did, it, you know, in the early 19th century. Yeah, you have a conductor. Um, but there is a growth, very, uh, there's very notable growth of um, the star conductor. And by the end, of the, uh, in, in some of them were in France, um, some of them were in England. Uh, they were, so it's another part of this growth of the musical um, marketplace. Uh, so I'm, I just t took on Bulo because uh, I found the way he worked with the mining orchestra really interesting and nobody 
now has people stand up to in the orchestra or learn it by memory, my God. Uh, so that's, that's why I put him in. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating mm -hmm. lecture. Um, so uh, you talked about, uh, you started with an American actually looking at, at Germany and you also in between talked about, for example, the way that uh, things in Paris were, were done in a way that actually then uh, um, inspired uh, Germans or, or would be taken over. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder, um, and, and I think of, of many others, the walls are going to America and, and then coming back. So there's a lot of um, exchange going on. And I wonder how mm -hmm. much of this is a transnational history and how much of it is German, how much is, is national. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. It, it's, it is very transnational um, and global as well. And, um, and it, it always was, really. Uh, because, you know, the Italians coming to Germany in, you know, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, and they kept coming. Um, musicians were always moving around. It, the ones who were um, able to, the good ones. Um, and I don't, think, I don't think these ensemble ones who were not getting paid very well um, moved around as much. They were probably, because they didn't have m not much money to do it, but some of them did emigrate to the United States and they would got, get jobs there because they were German musicians. But it's, it's absolutely moving, moving, moving. Uh, yeah, I was once in a, a, I had to do something, and I, uh, it, was a, it was a conference called um, People in Motion. <laughs> And uh, there were a couple people who wrote about, who had papers on music. And so you, could, you could absolutely put this as uh, it's transnational, it's global, it's portable everywhere. Uh, and um, I just wanted to have this in the German field. So uh, because to, to describe uh, how Germany became you know, one of the, well, the thing that everyone thought about, the country that everyone thought about when they thought about classical music. Um, that's partly what I'm trying to do, but I would n never um, say it's just German. In fact, you could probably say that, like they used to, that Germany was in the middle, and so they had something of everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, Martin Rempa um, has written a lot about that too, and I once wrote an article about it. Um, uh, so the military musician profession uh, became much more important in the 19th century in every country, every country. Uh, and it's in Germany, they had, uh, I guess, something that other countries didn't have. They had, they had a, a man named Wilhelm Wiebrecht who uh, was, he, he was a minor person in a court or, orchestra in Berlin. And he was, he, he was frustrated and he saw that um, uh, there was an opening for being the director of one of the Prussian court's um, military ensembles, you know, which had about 15 people in them. Um, and he got the job. Uh, he had been in orchestra, opera orchestra. And he, what he did to put um, military music in Germany, specifically, uh, into a kind of juggernaut, it's not just because we are the musical nation. What he did is did enormous amount of transcriptions of classical music into band form. Um, and so, the, yes, they did all the band music, the, the military marches, of course, um, but they also would play in concerts. I mean, this, this grew and grew from about the 1830s on. I think he died in the 1860s or 70s. Um, he, so they had a kind of entrepreneur of military music. Uh, it, and it's, 
you know, the signs of it are still there. He invented this thing called the Grosse Zapfenstreich, which is, you know, taps, this, or ta uh, the grand tattoo. And every time, you know, the, there's a new chancellor in Germany, um, they get the, the Grosse Zapfenstreich. And it's this very large military ceremony that Wieprecht had invented. Um, but that's... You know, that's only part of it. I mean, it was not all doing concerts, but that is one distinctive thing about the German military uh, military bands. Uh, they had lots of little ones, but they also had these very prestigious ones. Well, it's the same way here in the United States. We're not in the United States. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, but uh, in, in war, you know, it, um, in World War I, I know more about that than World War II because I haven't gotten there yet in my other book. Um, but uh, they did lots of stuff. For one thing, if you were a musician, you could sign up and probably be in a military band and you would be behind the lines, sometimes very close to the lines. Uh, uh, Paul Hindemith was in a military band. Um, you would sometimes be uh, doing concerts you would sometimes be uh, being a stretcher carrier back and forth from the front, uh, but it was better than being a regular soldier. Uh, but there were lots, of, and the French and British did this too, you know, but uh, I only know about the German military bands then. Uh, and I assume that there's lots of that in uh, Second World War. Uh, so um, after, the second, after the First World War, uh, the enormous numbers of military musicians that had become Germany's musical uh, military uh, ensembles, they were cut down completely. I mean, I think they were about two thirds of them were, had to be disbanded because they didn't have the money. And then they were, grew again. But that's, all, that's what I know about military bands. They, um, they were very popular in the 19th century. People would rather have listened to a military band in, a, in the square than um, a orchestra. <laughs> um, let, let me ask a, a question which isn't in your lecture, but I think which flows from this question. Mm -hmm. Two points. First of all, a positive, nice point. Women were so excluded, as you mentioned, uh, and if you look now on mezzo or any of these programs, you not only have women who are all over the orchestras, but have conductors as, yes. as their leaders, which is, a, a, I think, revolutionary, yeah. even from 20 years Yes. Yeah. However, yeah. my, my yeah. real question is this. Military marches. You said yesterday correctly, singing together binds you yes. together. You know, I don't know if you know English soccer. You'll never walk alone. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of people together. Mm -hmm. So the question I'm asking with regard to music and military music, does music have moral qualities? Can music enrage? Can music mobilize you to fight? Mm -hmm. Is music evil? Yeah. Yeah, as yeah. well as transcendent? Yeah, yeah. Impossible question. Yeah. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think so. It, it does, um, but not necessarily. It depends on what music you're playing. <laughs> no. uh, but it, it, but it, is, um, it is an emotional thing. I mean, really. Uh, and if it, I don't know. <laughs> I, that is why they have military bands. They, they, you know, they get you all excited. You know, it's it's loud and it's and it's got a really big rhythm and so that is um, uh, you know way back when military bands were very small like in the medieval periods just playing a little pipe um, they were just to keep the um, soldiers in rhythm but they grew and grew and uh, 19th century um, had also tons of not tons, but several international competitions with military bands. And at that point, you could say, well, this is warfare by another means, like the international expositions, and there were always military bands at international expositions. Um, but, you know, 
I, I can't really answer that question. If, if, if they weren't there, would the soldiers not have been <laughs> killing people? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a good Are there any more? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask about, uh, I really found it fascinating about the conductor, especially how much of everything you described is so similar to what's going on today. Mm -hmm. um, including uh, women, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, but this profession as a conductor that it was a late development, um, how, because I know today the virtuoso was considered like a non-serious form of music making, and today Sorry, we would yeah. rather speak of the interpreter and not the virtuoso, and uh, when did this happen and if it had anything to do with this uh, aura that developed around the conductor? Ah, the, so, right. So it's maybe some of the virtuoso aura transitioned to the conductor. Yeah. Yeah, and also, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess today pianists are more known as interpreters than uh, yeah. virtuosos in the, in the derogatory sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that the virtuosos then did a lot of improvising. Um, they, you know, they memorized music and so on, but I think in the, you know, the Paganini and the Liszt and various other ones were mostly known when somebody would give them a phrase and then they would do all these fireworks. So that, that was part of the, um, the thing. But the, the conductor thing um, is, I mean, it, it's, it's like, the growth of military things too. He, they were, they they were the um, they were the generals of these large ensembles of these large forces of of people, and um, they doesn't mean that they were militaristic or anything, but they were definitely as the as the um, century went on, they became uh, more and more dictators of uh, of the. The very interesting thing about the Berlin Philharmonic is, although they had very strong conductors, they also um, had self-government. Uh, and I'm not sure how far it went. Um, if uh, Bulow said, you have to pay, play Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, which nobody ever listens to, or <laughs> it's the second, they, they, they probably couldn't have said, we don't want to do that. Um, but uh, and but now you know you do have musicians unions might, might say that but usually not uh, so these things um, they came together in some ways and not in others uh, but do you want me to compare the conductor's fame to the virtuoso fame more? <laughs> uh, just this shift from um, I think the. Uh, improvisation explains a lot of it, but yeah. I, I think there was this shift from the uh, virtuosity and technical, uh, you know, being dazzling, mm -hmm. and this idea of interpreting a masterpiece, and you bring a singular interpretation as a yeah. performer. Um, yeah, it's true. And yeah. I mean, I, I wonder if, like, this profession of the conductor, if it played a part in this idea of also of performers. Yes, and you know, but it, but these things, I don't, didn't need to say it, but um, it's it's gradual, isn't it? You know, you you Mendelssohn was regarded um, as a kind of dictator, um, and other other conductors were not so much. Um, but he was actually, I think, the um, model of of the later um, conductors in the nineteenth century, um, and the virtuoso thing is is mostly described in writings about them as a fad kind of thing. The, the um, Liszt and Talberg and um, Paganini and so on. Um, and they, because they were doing a lot of, of um, improvisations. And if we want to see somebody improvising now, you go to jazz concerts. Uh, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think solo, um, solo, Violinists, I don't know. What do I know about that? <laughs> uh, it would be interesting to know if they did. Uh, but mostly, when you know, during that pandemic, um, when we were watching things, uh, I don't know if any of you watched um, 
Igor, Igor, Levick. Igor Levick, doing all of the, um, the Beethoven sonatas in Berlin. But he was playing them beautifully, but he wasn't changing what was on there. And so it's different. Yeah. All right, I'm afraid we have yeah. to stop, but this was another virtuoso performance. <laughs> not, not really. <laughs> I was not improvising. <laughs>